Yep, there you go. Okay, so a quick introductions for us. So my name is Joe Gelb. I'm president and co-founder of Zoom In Software. We're uh, focusing on helping companies to deliver their content, all the great content you're creating and uh, taking taking advantage of all the great skills you're learning at this conference and other conferences and really putting that uh, in front of your customers and uh, stakeholders. So that's what we do. I'll uh, ask Janice to briefly introduce herself. Hi, thank you, Joe. Um, I am Janice Cadell. I am the director here at of uh, Technical Publications at Shiji, which is an uh, an IT company specializing specializing in hospitality IT. So we do documentation for like point of sales, property management systems, and anything in the hospitality industry. Great. Thanks for joining. And uh, Paul, would like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. I'm, uh, my name is Paul Lorenz. I work for a software company uh, called Axway. And uh, we are involved in a lot of uh, business type software in areas, for example, of API management, uh, business to business, uh, managed file transfers, and so on. And uh, we write documentation for all these products, about 50 of them in total, and uh, currently have most of the stock published on our, our Zoom and hosted uh, documentation portal. Right. Very nice. Thanks, Paul. And Ryan, over to you. Uh, my name is Ryan Schubert. I'm the uh, Tech Pubs Manager at uh, Comscope Ruckus Networks. We make um, wired and wireless uh, networking devices. AP switches and so on. Our team creates all of the product documentation for those product guides. And uh, we also use Zoom in as our content delivery portal for our customer facing product guides. Very good. Okay, thanks to all the, the three of you. I have to say, I'm really excited to have this panel. We've been, I've been working with all three of you for the past number of years. And, uh, you know, a number of years ago, we were talking about dynamic delivery and HTML, uh, you know, going to websites. That was a really cool thing. And then search. You know, faceted search taxonomies. Now we're talking about AI, and all three of you have really been spearheading actually implementing this for your for your live site and bringing it in front of customers. So hopefully, everyone in the audience here will be able to benefit from the experience that you're bringing to the table here, and and we'll get going. So before we get going at some of the questions, I want to give a little bit of a framework uh, about what we've been talking about, and you know, I'm not the first one talking about AI in the conference yet, so you've heard about it a lot. But it really is, as you've been hearing, is, is really transforming the way we work. When we're talking about content authoring, which um, which a lot of us do, or we manage authors, and or we're involved with that in some way. So AI is transforming that. We heard some folks talking about that. Management, translation, we heard some people talking about that. Content publishing, and as well as analytics. But all these things really are all focused on creating better customer services, customer services and experiences, right? That's why we're creating this content. That's the point of why we're putting this in front of our customers to have better experiences and, and have better support around our products. So we always have to kind of keep that in mind. And although the AI is, is helping us with a lot of these other functions that we're doing, putting it front and center for the six, the user experience is, uh, is I think really key. In the beginning of the year when, when AI was starting to become the new, it was a bona fide buzzword at that point, I think. Uh, so, we produced a, a paper to try to predict what was going to happen. And you can download that here if you'd like. It's still, I think, pretty relevant. But uh, I think one of the, you know, if we think about what companies are investing in AI the most, right? So if we talk about all these different companies in the world and, and AI is what they're trying, they're trying to implement AI in some way, what would be the the most, you know, the most useful thing or the thing that they are most focused on when it comes to investing in AI technologies. I don't know if that's something people can put things in the, into the chat there, what you guys think. Um, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler. And the, really, the number one priority is for enterprise in, in AI is in customer service experiences. Okay, so we look at this Forbes chart of all the different things you can be using AI for, customer service really comes to the front, which for us, it's really good news. We're sitting on the gold mine of content, and what we do in our daily life went from, you know, from 
various different levels of priority back in the olden days to something that's very much in the fore these days. So I think that's something we should be all proud of and also something that we just need to be uh, kind of taking that responsibility and learning how to, figuring out how to help our com companies to, to, uh, to, you know, really get, make good use of the content in order to, and, and put that with AI to provide better ser services. So when we talk about what you need to get in order to get GPT ready, there's three basic things that we think about. And one, one is consolidating the content, meaning you have documentation content of different formats, but there's other content in your organization that's becoming more and more important that can help answer questions. It could be knowledge articles. It could be, it could be training material, API content. So consolidating content in order to hook into the AI layer. There's a content governance. I don't know about, about all of you in the audience, but the vast majority of companies that we work with, not everything is public. There is some kind of content that is private, maybe small percentage, maybe a, a large percentage, but making sure that people are not getting AI answers based on content that they're not allowed to see is paramount. And the third thing is making sure the GPT capabilities is available pretty much anywhere. So once we are able to put together a content framework or content infrastructure with an AI layer on top of that, that should be available in a lot of different types of interfaces. So again, back then it was in the good old days, it was okay, I can get a, a portal up and running and get my CDP up and, and running. But now it's it's much more uh, much more important to say, look at our content as an infrastructure and as an enabler for our, our organizations to to make better use of this content and uh, and put it in front of, and put it on AI layer and make and make, and get better better value. So there's three live sites at least, um, and we're going to be talking about today. So uh, Janice and Ryan and Paul, these are um, three sites that are live for customers. And I think we're definitely very proud of that. I think you guys really are proud of that as well. And we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, I have to. I have to give a little bit of a, a plug. So here, if you look at um, at at one of the sites here, so this is a public facing portal. You can go to to docs.ggggroup.com. And when you enter a search, it's not just giving you a, a search results, but now if you actually ask a question, it's giving you GPT-based results. And that's just an example of what of what uh, CG is being able to provide as well as Ryan and, and Comscope and Paul as well. And there, all those sites are, are public and you can go and take a look at them and see how they work with GPT. Back to this. So what I'd like to start out with is asking um, panelists, what have you, what made you decide to spearhead a GPT and implementation at your particular company? And what objectives are you hoping to achieve? Maybe Janice, you can you can answer that first. Sure. Thank you, Jack. Um, well, it was interesting. Um, so almost simultaneously, at the same time that Zoomin announced the their availability of providing um, GPT on, on our uh, documentation portal, one of our one of our groups, somebody in, in one of our organizations, sent me an email asking the same question: Would it be possible for us to have um, Chat GPT on on our documentation portal? So it seemed like this is the perfect time to pursue this. And, and um, that's when I, you know, once, once zoom in uh, made the announcement, I reached back out to them and said, um, this is something that we really want. Um, we, um, I'm always trying to improve our user experience, trying to find ways that we can best serve our customers, um, provide, Another, you know, another area I thought we sort of struggled with is in our in our doc portal was the search, and this would really help, you know, provide a better search experience for for again for our users and just I was, you know, this could help us get the information out there to our customers in a much easier way that 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 they'd be much more successful in finding what they look for. So it just seemed that the stars were aligned <laughs> um, at the time that Zoom in announced that they would be able to provide this type of functionality on our, on our site. Great, thanks. So Paul, for you also, what what made you decide to to take the leap and spearhead the GPT implementation at your company? 
at Axway? Well, I think for us also, it was a matter of uh, different things kind of coalescing at, at, at the same time. Um, our, earlier this year, our R&D team had launched a, uh, a research initiative into different aspects of artificial intelligence, basically trying to uncover um, ways that we can leverage it and use it for ways to help our customers find information quicker, faster, more efficiently, and also just to, you know, frankly, just to keep pace with uh, what other companies are, are, are trying to do or wanting to do with, with AI. At the same time, um, we had been uh, using a federated search feature to um, kind of uh, bring together content on a number of our different customer facing portals. Mm -hmm. And that initiative was kind of faltering a bit through really no fault of anyone here. It's just a matter of uh, different circumstances occurring. But then at that time, um, Zooman pops up and says, hey, how would you like to try our GPT beta? So I thought that was sounded really exciting. And uh, uh, after um, I got that invitation from Zooman, I started uh, the process internally of trying to get sign-offs from different layers of management to participate in that. But I thought it was potentially a very good new way to let users uh, find information and perhaps in a way that uh, is superior to just the uh, leg legacy search that we're all so much accustomed to. Mm -hmm. Who, who particularly at your organization was supportive, and who was maybe was there, if the, were there any detractors who were were against putting this out? Um, at, at our company, probably the biggest booster I had was what was a particular vice president who had launched the uh, the AI uh, study initiative. He, he thought this was a, a terrific thing to um, to try. The, uh, we're, we didn't have really have detractors per se, but we had people who were careful, like our security teams and our legal department, who were, you know, they just had concerns about uh, uh, data privacy and proprietary information and so on. So uh, fortunately, um, Zoom and Caden prepared with a lot of FAQs that I could pass along to my management and also um, to answer some of their questions. And also I could, Zuman was very um, willing to put their people forward to answer questions to um, help us um, do whatever concerns that there were mm -hmm. regarding pri uh, data privacy and so on. Mm -hmm. Very good. You know, we've been hearing kind of linking back to what we were talking about earlier is that, you know, companies are trying to get some kind of AI out and, uh, and self-service is on top of everyone's mind percentage wise. That's what people are mostly focused on. So, you know, for being able to, to put GPT or, you know, AI onto a, a, a current, like a portal that's already customer facing is probably a real boon to be able to kind of roll that out and really be the first one to have AI in your organization. It's really, uh, it's pretty exciting. So maybe we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about the journey of how getting of how you actually get got GPT implemented at your organization. So Ryan, it would be great if you kind of roll, bring us through the process that you went through uh, to get GPT rolling. And you're on mute right now. Ryan, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? That's better. Thank you. All right, unmuted. Yeah. So I was I was just saying that um, for us, one of the advantages we had is we have Zoom in as an ex pre existing platform. So uh, obviously, earlier this year, you reached out to us about this new AI feature, and we were interested. 
We had some initiatives going on as well internally for development, mm -hmm. leveraging AI as a productivity tool. And also we were interested in what we can do for our customers with AI. And kind of in that same time frame, you had presented that um, Zoom and GPT based tool. So we wanted to definitely take advantage of it. We had that existing content delivery portal with you guys with about a thousand public facing HTML product documents. And so that's that's where our initiation began. Like it seemed like we met all of the prerequisites. We have that existing portal, we have existing content, we have public facing content, not gated, and we have a company and a desire to make that available to our customers through this enhanced search, this ChatGPT tool. So that that's where we began kind of our kickoff of our project. So we got internal teams. We're a larger company of acquisitions. So we have like five different tech pubs teams. And we got together, determined this is all something we wanted to move forward with, and then reached out to you guys as well as our internal stakeholders to understand more about, you know, the um, what this project would mean in terms of concerns around AI and security and content and just how the architecture works. That's sort of basically where it began, that the launch of the project. The a very you have this kind of highlighted here. A very important step was legal approvals. So our legal team want to know much more about what, how this works, what systems and tools it has access to. So a big part of that initial process was simply working with the legal team and educating them as we also got educated on how the product works, just giving them also background on how our content delivery portal works, what its access is limited to, that public content is included, not gated content. It has no access to our development systems, our internal systems, and um, getting legal is kind of blessing and not only on using this system, but also the wording we'd use on the site. So there's a nice little widget on the site itself where it says, um, I forget what it's called, like the limitations. There's like a little legal blurb that we had to get finalized on the team to be rolled out onto the site. So a big part of this whole process is also just doing everything, kind of our staging, our development environment that was internal for employees and putting that initial team together as part of that kickoff, who will oversee this and obviously work with your project team to roll this out. I don't know what step two is. I don't know if we want to go into that, but I should pause there. Yeah, no, go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah. So so on the UAT side, so we set up that user acceptance testing portal. A big thing for us was just what the look and feel of this new chat GPT AI would look like. We wanted to make it very clear to our internal teams, let alone our customers when it was available to them, that this is a beta. This is something that's experimental, it's early access, it's in test. We also wanted to make sure those legal limitations were clearly called out. So just simply working on the UI mockups and UI frames was a large part of the process while we also worked in parallel with development just to make sure the testing worked. Um, a big um, part of that was just going back and forth on what it looks like in our portal, what the layout of these buttons, the layout of the warnings, the rendering of text, that was pretty huge and also working with legal there. At the same time too, we basically got a team of stakeholders across our different tech pubs organizations to identify um, all of the testing we wanted to do. So a big thing we want to do in GPT and all these systems is test the accuracy of, an answer, of its answers to your questions. So we initially put together like a large list. I think it was like 50 to 75 questions. And so there was a process in itself to put those together from just questions off the top of our head to questions based on what customers regularly search for to sort of the reverse where we we open one random document that was HTML, go to a random page, read that page, and then ask a question about that page and see if it would point us back to that page. So that was a very significant process just to put those questions together and then to work on the team to test those questions. And to be very clear, this is like an iterative process. This is something we did over days and over the course of a month going back and forth based on the accuracy of questions, giving feedback to the developers at Zoom in to inquire about um, how to improve these answers, how to make changes, and they would make tweaks to the system and to the search. And they, I think they eventually moved from GPT 3.5 to 4.0 to help improve with the results. But it was definitely a, a back and forth and iterative process. And then once we kind of got that pretty well baked, we expanded the testing out to a wider audience in our support organization. So support's what we heavily leveraged to also test the system and measure the accuracy of answers and questions. So in the end, it was a very, very large spreadsheet of who was testing what, answers, the accuracy of those answers, whether or not the answers were valid, and then any kind of questions about the answers not being valid, we'd categorize them, we'd write up notes, and then pass those on to the development team. And then that last step, the go live was basically, so we did a, a roughly a month of testing. And the end goal was to have like 
90% accuracy on the answers for us to feel comfortable with making it um, go live on our production site. And so once, once we hit that mark and we were comfortable with it and we got the blessing of our larger support organization, we basically turned the system on. So it became available to all users. They didn't have to sign in. It wasn't just employees only. So now they have this option if they use that question mark as the trigger to ask questions of the system. And so that's kind of um, where we ended in, I think it was the beginning of August where it went live from there. Well, it's already been, already been about three months. Well. Very good. Yeah, this is, I think it's just, you're pointing out the layout. Maybe I'll just kind of show the folks with the layout that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so here, if I go and ask a question, do you, do you have a question that you'd like to ask? ask so, so even on here, I should point out, so like in this search bar, if you click that little eye icon, so there's some more information here where it says, uh, so there's, an, there's a little bullet at the bottom, the answers to questions, uh, yeah. So we have that note there. And then when you actually ask a question, now we can just put in something generic for now, like how do I upgrade, which is way too vague. So I don't know if that will have an, an answer actually, probably should have staged an answer before, but you can do, how do I upgrade my switch? We'll just try one. I'll tell you what I use sometimes, but I like when I go to your site. Yeah. So on this user interface here, we still have this beta label because we're considering it basically like early access testing. And then off to the right, I think there's something blocking my view. I think it, it will render out once it renders a, an answer where it says like the limitations and legalese mm -hmm. uh, to the question that we also want to show customers. Got it. So I think it's thinking, right? Yeah. yeah. So it will pop up a little button there because one of the things that our legal was very interested in making sure that people were familiar with it, like the answers aren't guaranteed here. The answers shouldn't like cause support cases or other concerns. So it's basically kind of use these answers at your own risk as, as some legal coverage because they don't, they're worried about it generating an answer that might not be exactly accurate. Right. So there's an interesting question because it's- So it's it was like right General there, the about, about AI-based search results in the upper right. Right. Yeah. So, so that kind of has the legal jargon about Search results are not guaranteed to be complete or accurate. So it's just a coverage there. Hmm. Yeah. And they have the rating here in order to see whether yeah. you have feedback whether the answer is accurate. Well, with the right. And then suitable. when you get that answer, you also have that learn more in the bottom, which was something we really liked. Because again, being um, a technical publications organization, we really want to know where this is coming from. And you want to be able to jump to that topic or manual. Um, and that's just something that's critical for us. So to, to get the actual source of content. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Great. So, so we saw some examples of uh, of content. We saw some examples of sites, and we talked about the process. Janice, what kind of content do you generally have your on, available on your on your portal and accessible to the GPT? And what what kind of content seems to be the most effective to deliver answers via the GPT? So we have both public and gated content. Right now, only our gated content is available for ChatGBT. Um, and we were, um, I, I believe, I think Paul had mentioned it too, trying to work with our security team to, to help them understand um, that maybe we should be able to, to see if they would allow us to provide access to our gated content. So there are a lot of concerns about that. Mm -hmm. um, but what I am finding is that um, for the for the public content that people are using, um, they're they're asking the right questions. They're getting the answers. I'm finding the success rate for that when I look at the analytics to be very high in terms of of getting the answers that they need. Um, the issues are when it's the gated content. Obviously, the it's not even able, able to provide that 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 information to them and is only able to possibly offer some some options to them um, as, as topics to search for in the results. Mm -hmm. Got it. Meaning that the, the content, when someone logs in, they have access to the gated content. Um, but right now, from a legal point of view, we haven't you haven't been given the the thumbs up from legal to actually let GPT have access to that gated content for that particular individual in order to provide an answer. 
Correct. Correct. Yes. Um, so it's a little, and then someone I see is asking how, how I'm able to measure the success. And um, it is a little bit challenging because knowing that a, a, such a large majority of our content is gated. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm only able to kind of look at it and see, I look at the answers to the information that, um, that people are providing, um, you know, the answers that they're getting for the public content. Mm -hmm. I think I saw another question pop up there, but it was very quick. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. um yeah. Do, do you want to answer those questions later, or you want me to give input on those, or the, which the ones that are? So, the, so there yeah, was, one just came. One I don't know if you want up. other members of the oh. panel to chime in. Oh. So. Got I'll it. chime I'm in real quick, so I'm just being rude. Sure. Um, okay. There was one, so how are you measuring the success rate? And so mm -hmm. one of the things we got from Zoom and GPT is like three areas. It's they We get a listing of all the questions that were answered by GPT. We get a listing of the questions that weren't answered by the GPT. And then we also have a feedback. So that's one of the things initially we were manually checking. So you can imagine if customers ask like 100 different questions, there's no, at least for now, automated way for us to determine the accuracy of those. So what we'll do is we'll take a sample of those like each week and look at them and then do an assessment whether or not they're answered. But the tool itself will tell you, you know, 200 questions were asked, 100 were answered. So that's 50% accuracy. But we kind of have this kind of audit we're doing once a week to look at this. It does take time, but it's something that's new to us. So we're putting in a little bit of time to check the accuracy and why also questions aren't unanswered. And then there was a second question about, um, can you let customers know if content is supported or not supported? That's like really hard for us to do. What we do right now, if we can't answer a question, we have a generic kind of line of text to the customers saying like, we couldn't find an answer to your question. Can you try providing more context? Otherwise, can you look for um, your results in the search below? So the default search is still there. There's also another caveat we put in there saying basically, this search for us on our site only includes publicly available content. So the problem there is even the customer won't know what's public and what's not public. It might not be transparent to them, but we try to list those limitations. It's like, this is only public content. You might need to clarify your question and then you can still always use the default search results below. That's kind of been our blanket, but we're still working to improve things. Right, and we have something quite similar. And I don't remember the exact wording now that you mentioned it with when they do, uh, we have basically three types of, error messages that, that that would pop up there. And and that that is, you know, one of them. But the same thing is, you know, sometimes people aren't quite aware of what is what is not public. You know, why isn't this public or why don't I have access to it because I logged in. Um, so then, you know, what you know, they have to really have that understanding of of, of what is gated to them, you know, to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Should add like a little link there that says if you're not happy with this answer, click here to send an email to legal. <laughs> <laughs> I like to, I like to do it. And it, you know, I think, um, you know, legal is is hearing the the concerns of all the world of the world out there <laughs> mm -hmm. when there's all these discussions on on AI. Right. So Ryan, we're getting back to uh, kind of the content itself. Is there certain types of content that you feel is is more um, GPT useful? Uh, that, uh, for example, there would be certain types of um, types of guides or certain types of content that you think is is more useful or less useful for 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 GPT type of answers. Um. So, so for us, it's all of our product guides or other like the installation configuration. Those are the ones that we find people asking the most questions about around our install and upgrade procedures. I don't know if that's what you're necessarily meaning by being so content specific. The bulk of our questions go into those documents. And so GPT, the, the AI add-ons, it's good for finding information in those documents, the installation upgrade questions. We do get other realms of questions um, that aren't covered in our documentation. So our portal, this is just more background. It's really those customer facing product guides but a customer might be looking for something about like end of life information or warranties or support that isn't currently in our portal. So, um, I mean, if it's not in our portal, it's obviously not helpful to the customers to try and find it, but like installation configuration guides are definitely some of the best things where they find good answers and it jumps them right to what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. 
Got it. So we have a question. Do any of the answers from the GPT model ever have subtle inaccuracies that aren't detected right away? Or has a customer ever given feedback on an answer? Yes. This happens um, quite often. We have we've had a situation uh, ongoing for a very long time where we have uh, customers who are reluctant to use product filters. And this is especially important for our site because we have documentation for about 50 different products. So if you go to our our portal and you and you you know ask to see release notes, it's and you don't have a product context, um, you may not get anything near what your expectation is. So we're noticing this too in GPT. A uh, user will ask a question like, um, how, "How do I import a CSV file or something like something generic like that?" Well, that could there could be answers in, you know, a dozen different products for how you would do that. And uh, GPT might come up with an answer, but is it the one the user was looking for? Um, we can't tell because currently the analytics uh, doesn't tell us whether users are using filters or not when they're asking their, their GPT questions. But we are looking closely at the Zoom and Analytics uh, dashboard. They have a new dashboard with uh, GPT da data. And one of those uh, small dashboards is a, a click-through rate on um, GPT uh, responses. And it's actually, at this point, a, a very low percentage. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, uh, GPT searches as a percentage of all searches is also uh, quite low. Uh, and I attribute that partially because we're still trying to get the word out to our external users that this is available. Um, mm -hmm. Another is that uh, a user specifically has to type a question mark in the search field to trigger, you know, they have to consciously trigger GPT to make to make it work. Um, and the way this has been implemented in some other websites that I've seen, uh, you, you, you don't necessarily need a question mark to generate uh, a response. Now, Zoomin will support, um, if we want to get rid of the question mark requirement, Zoomin has told us that they, if the user types any search string, that will trigger a GPT response. And, but we haven't decided whether we want to go to that route yet, because I would prefer initially to have, have our external users at least conscious that they're trying to get a, a GPT response rather than simply spitting out a GPT response or non-response based on any search string. Mm -hmm. So um, currently right now we're running about 3% of all total searches are GPT searches. Mm -hmm. Interesting. OK. So on the topic of, of, uh, of the analytics, so what kind of lessons are you learning about so you're talking about lessons you're learning about the searches and some of the accuracy, but what lessons have you learned about the content? Is there anything that you learned that was unexpected? Um, do you feel that structured content performs better than unstructured content? So anything you'd like to share about that, Janice, maybe you can take a first crack at that. Sure. Um, and interesting, I looked at our analytics as Paul was talking. We also are 3% 3, 3 of the searches are GPT also. Um, what, what we're learning is, and it's it's something that we learn with even in just regular search too is that terminology is very important. Mm -hmm. um, you know the GPT is 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 very particular. I think about the terminology, and so um, we have to be careful because you may have some inaccurate 
results because the terminology is inconsistent. Um, also in the hospitality industry, there are terms that are used within hospitality that have different meanings than, um, than somebody would also use them in, in, in um, you know, for, for other things. And, and I, I can think of like a, a, a quick example um, could be just the word properties because somebody could be searching for properties that has to do with something they're configuring, but properties are also properties in hotels. So um, we really have to be careful about how we are wording things to make it easier for people to find things through, through GPT. Um, and we also have it, the way our organization works um, to tell you, you know, just give you a really quick background about our, our content. We, it isn't just all technical documentation or um, content that's written by technical writers. We have a lot of content contributors who are writing information that just needs to, to be consumed by, by our customers, by, by our partners. And they're not, they don't have that technical writing background. They don't have that mindset. So we really need to work on ways to enforce guidelines um, to make it easier for the consistency across. And if you have the consistency across the board, then you're also going to have better results with, with chat GPT. Um, and again, a lot of it goes back to, it, it doesn't just go back to the terminology, but it even goes back to how you're titling, um, or, or using headings and, and, um, a lot of people who are, don't have that experience. They're just thinking that they're the only ones putting content out there and not realizing how if you have a lot of um, headings that are just not as specific, you're, the people who are, who are putting in the questions um, into ChatGPT may not get the, the results that they would have gotten if their topics and their headings and their sentences were a little bit more specific. It's interesting because... Uh... We tend to think that AI is like gonna make everything everything so much easier. Well, I think it's so a lot of these issues that we've been talking about for a long time in this in this industry and in, in our profession, terminology management, style management, consistency, structure. These are um these are I guess this these problems are getting exacerbated exacerbated by the AI and not necessarily um ameliorated. So that seems like quality of the content needs to be even in some ways, it has to be even better in order for the for the accuracy or the effectiveness of the of the answers to be to be high. Right, and and to recognize that you're not writing in a va you're not writing in a vacuum. You, that um, it, it it shouldn't be just it it's, it shouldn't seem like there's multiple multiple voices coming from <laughs> from an organization. It it should just be one voice. It should be blind to the consumer that, you know, there was a hundred people putting content out there and they, in their mind, there's just one. Mm -hmm. um, Paul, that, what, what lessons did you learn about your content going through this experience? Well, right now, um, we have a mix of gated and ungated content on our doc portal. And the majority of the content is public um, but there is a limitation now with the uh, GPT in that it, it doesn't encompass our, our PDFs. And we have uh, a lot of PDFs, probably about half of all of our content we publish <laughs> is in PDF. And, um, and it's because this is, it's what our customers want. So, you know, personally, I, would love to get rid of PDFs, but those pesky customers won't let us. Um, and GPT doesn't encompass that. Also, we are we are currently trying to get legal approval to to include gated content. Uh, at this point, it would be gated HTML content. Um, but I haven't um, got a reply from them yet. But uh, the limitation there would, of course, be if you want to include 
gated content in your GPT, then the user has to be logged on. So right. you can't have an anonymous user returning um, uh, gated information. Um, so then you have an issue of, um, you have to uh, find a way to encourage more people to, to log on to your portal. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of entering a, a situation, I think, where we're going to be having more and more gated content that we're publishing because of general security concerns. Mm -hmm. Got it. Ryan, what kind sure. of uh, what have you what have you been learning about your content? After so. To be honest, like so we're a tech pubs organization. Our focus first is on developing content for the customers, creating it, publishing it, maintaining it, and all that stuff. We never have done really deep dives into the analytics before of like how exactly our customers are asking questions, searching for content, doing sort of that thing. So that that's kind of enlightening to us. One of the things that we noticed that's very specific with GPT is our customers heavily use acronyms. They use different terminology that's in our um, books kind of like what Janice was talking about. I, I think the simple metaphor I can kind of give of like, there's three ways you can ask a kind of a question about like, say you're looking at your laptop, how do I upgrade my laptop? How do I upgrade Windows? How do I upgrade to Windows 10? And mm -hmm. we don't write three different ways in our content, we write one way. So we refer to our products by the hardware platform name, we refer to the operating systems by the operating system name, but customers often will interchange these. So we're seeing they're not getting the answers they expect because they're using either an acronym or some synonym that's not in our system. And so that's something we want to work on to improve. So it's, it's one of the areas that we've noticed that like basically customers are asking for licensing information on their ICX device, but our licensing guide is called a fast iron licensing guide. So they won't necessarily find a hit or a match. That's an overly generic example, but we're finding a lot of that where they're not finding a match because GPT doesn't know that these two products are related or they're synonyms of each other because they're completely different words. And we're not gonna go rewrite all of our content to cover all these. So we need to leverage something like synonyms or basically pass metadata to GPT so it knows that these keywords and terms are the same or interchangeable. So that's one of the areas we're gonna work on. So one of the things we did and we continue to do when we're measuring accuracy is we're trying to identify like, what are these key areas where we're missing information? And right now we kind of have five and two of them we can really control. So one is just the vague questions uh, that folks ask. I think someone mentioned it earlier where they're saying like, how do I, um, what is it like, how do I upgrade my switch? And it's like, which switch do you own? We need them to specify which product it is. And then also the other side of that answer is, we have different ways of upgrading our devices. There's via the CLI, via the cloud-based application, or uh, via a standalone application. So the question might point them to something, something they don't intend. What they should try and specify is how do I upgrade my switch via CLI? Then they'll get that correct answer. So there's not much we can do there other than trying to educate our customer. Another area that people have mentioned is gated content. They're looking for things that aren't available in the gated system. So again, we can't do much until we allow gated content. A third area is people are looking for stuff that's just not in the system, right? You can get I mean, this is a trivial example, like what's the meaning of life, right? You'll get random questions like that in there. And obviously we don't have stuff like that in there. And then the final two we're working on is the synonyms. We really want to improve synonyms in the system because that's pretty common that customers use. And the last one's like the metadata area. Someone, for example, they're looking for information in a hardware installation guide. So they'll say something like, how do I install my ICX 8200? And in the ICX 8200 book, the title is ICX 8200, but the actual topic that it's pulling from never restates the switch name. So usually in our guides, we don't repeat that product name over and over in the topic. You'll have a topic that says, here's the checklist for installing the device, or here's the checklist for installation. And it doesn't say in every sentence, in every topic and paragraph, ICX 8200, ICX 8200. And so you won't get a match on that. But a human would know when I open the ICX 8200 guide, anything in here is related to the 8200. So that should be a piece of metadata that gets passed to the AI so it can return those relevant answers. But that's kind of um, the areas we're, we're looking at to try and improve those two last ones, synonyms and metadata. And this is stuff that we didn't really think about before when we put our content out there, how customers so, are searching for content. And on the subject of synonyms, uh, Zoomin supports synonyms, uh, synonyms file for uh, legacy search, but doesn't yet support synonyms for GPT, but I'm expecting them to 
do that uh, shortly, maybe by the end of the year or perhaps right. first quarter of next year. I've heard it'll be part of the next generation search that they're working on. And then even on activity on our own side, like we have to build out those synonyms list. I wouldn't even ask our support, do we have a synonyms list for our regular web portal? And they kind of don't. So it's something we're gonna have to build right. over time. So we have we have a synonyms list for our for legacy search. I've already have been starting to prep our technical writers to have them think about synonyms for in the context of GPT, with the idea in mind that synonyms that we can leverage for GPT, we can also leverage for our legacy search as well. So um, I'm I'm looking to improve the synonyms list for in both uh, contexts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Again, I mean, what software what software company doesn't have you know alphabet soup of acronyms? Right. It's all it's all about acronyms. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. For us, also as as the vendor, we've also, also been very valuable to get the the feedback and the and see what the experiences are and and to create that roadmap of like okay, what's what needs to be rolled out? How do we tweak things? How do we how is the the ability to configure the system is how do we uh, how do we do that? Um, um, so that's been for us has also been been useful. Now, the the exciting thing is that these these sites are live and they're being useful, and like any other software product, it needs to be, you know, kind of slowly rolling out new changes to things in order to make sure that they're uh, they're go always going forward and not uh, not not the other direction. Um, So maybe we can sum up a little bit and uh, then we can ask some questions. So if we sum up, I think some of the things that I've been hearing or during the discussion and uh, previous discussions with you is number one, that uh, curated, from a curated content set point of view, that GPT is set to provide answers from your content set and not from public stores, knowledge stores um, or the open web or and not even from gated content. You know, if you're if you don't have the content available yet, like we talk, the technology is, is making that available. But um, from a legal point of view, that's becoming a little bit of a stumbling block of actually allowing GPT to get access to, to gated content for those people who are logged in. Um, but I think as you mentioned also, Ryan, sometimes people are asking questions and the content is just not in that. And the content, it's not, it's not in the documentation. It, it may be in a knowledge article, it may be in a training, it may be somewhere else. How do we get more and more of that content into our documentation portal. I mean, the documentation portal is now kind of evolving from documentation portal to technical resource center or technical technical um, knowledge center. And so in helping to educate our our other stakeholders that you know we can bring other content into this as well. Um, it'll be make the whole experience much more easy and and and, uh, and useful and get um, more potential answers available to to the customers. Um, we talked about trans transparent. I'm sorry, Brian. We're going to say something about that. Okay, um, transparency and uh, backward compatibility. So, um, we mentioned during the when we showed some examples that the response is being supplemented with links to the actual source. Um, I think also I think we mentioned that those are also useful. Meaning, just showing an answer is is, is with the type of content that we have is not really is not enough. Being able to link back to to more of the longer form details of the um, of the answer is important. I think to some extent the GPT is giving us an answer, but it's also giving us a summarization of longer form content. And sometimes maybe we can say the longer form content is maybe just a lot of extra words that don't need to be there. But I think a lot of us as practitioners know that the content there is written there for a purpose. And if GPT is giving us an extraction or a specific answer, a linking back to the more detailed responses I think is uh, is, is also is also key. Uh, the anal anal analytics that we spoke about and allowing, allowing you to identify when the GPT is actually useful and when it's when there's gaps in the content or gaps in the understanding or gaps in understanding what people are asking for. We think people are asking, when we wrote the documentation, we thought people were asking one thing and really maybe they're asking other types of things. Or maybe they're asking things we never thought about. Maybe we're answering answers, we're answering things that people aren't asking about. So allowing have that, an analytics to actually get a 
feedback about the efficacy and the uh, and the accuracy of the of the answers, but also maybe learning more about our content and what's you know what kind of content is really being provided, and how can we improve that content in order to provide the answers that better? I'd be happy if any of you to uh, to comment on these. Would you agree with these, or would you would you add or subtract from any of this? So I would just want to add on the analytics side is um, we're really interested as that dashboard develops because I know the new analytics dashboard's also in beta. So we gave some feedback a while back and a lot of that feedback's been implemented. So we're looking forward to like leveraging that in the future. The big new thing for us, again, in tech pubs, normally we're just like looking in the past, I should say not necessarily we, but um, we were just looking at traffic. Is our content being used and, and mm -hmm. things like that? But the new thing we need to check is the accuracy of the answered questions and unanswered questions. And to try and make that easier for us to get that feedback from the system, to make that in the dashboards is, is very interesting to us. Mm -hmm. And also to be able to share that information with our own management and other teams. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, as you're mentioning, the this is a uh, the site's been live for three months. Your site and uh, being able to learn about what the experiences are and and what data to put in those dashboards and what could be what's useful in order to make the experience better and what's useful for you um, as practitioners, as first is also very valuable. So, I right. think uh, mm -hmm. like in you know all things, GPT is not is not a magic solution. My experience with SEO over the years is that it's just an ongoing journey and there's very few, uh, you know, eureka moments where you uh, crush some uh, challenging um, thing that's, uh, that you need to uh, conquer. Um, the, the, the analytics, um, I'm looking forward to these new tools that Zoomin is planning on rolling out uh, as far as um, having the uh, the topic analysis tool, right? That a, a tech writer can actually go into a topic and uh, press a button, and um, they'll get some guidance about uh, how you know how they can uh, improve their, their their writing to uh, make the topic uh, better or more consumable. Yeah, that's a, that's called editorial copilot. So we don't we don't yet have that, um, but I'm looking forward to getting that. Uh, this would really be a help, especially in in the case for our technical writers, because we don't have a technical writers organization. We don't have a tech pubs department. Uh, basically, our our tech writers are all decentralized and. Uh, we don't have a, a centralized editing function, for example. Uh, we have uh, global style guidelines and so on, but uh, technical, technical writers are really on their own in our company to not only uh, write their own content, but to be their own editors. So having a, um, a co-pilot tool like this, I think it would be a really big help for, for our writers. Mm -hmm. Have, have like an editor on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. Right. Very good. So getting back to um, some of the other summaries from we're talking about uh, during the conversation about low fuzziness tolerance, meaning um, the algorithm that we're using now is configured to provide a, a don't know response instead of an inaccurate one. I mean, a lot of you, all three of you, I can make mention the different points about accuracy, needing to have a high level degree of accuracy before rolling this out or, or making sure that the GPT is not making up stuff, is not hallucinating. So sometimes that gets balanced with that. You know, you wanna have the something accurate and other, on the other hand, you don't wanna have, if it's if it's not confident with an, about an answer to to say, I don't know, instead of providing it. And there's kind of a balance between trying to make sure you get a, a useful answer and then just being able to say, I, I don't I don't have enough confidence to, to give an answer. Um, legal disclaimers, all but three of you mentioned that uh, the legal team has been um, uh, challenging to to uh, kind of making sure that things are in place to, to make this, I guess, 
faith legally, um, ensuring users don't know that know that answers are not guaranteed to be complete or accurate or provided without a warranty. Um, talked a little about that. And about crowdsource of reinforcement training, meaning using feedback to help train and improve the model, meaning how can we continue to get feedback? Right now, I think Ryan and the others mentioned that this, this is, uh, in some way, this is a little bit manual, going and seeing, okay, what are people asking? What are, what are, the, what are the, actually the answers? Um, by going and being more smart over time about how we can actually train the model and make the answers more, more accurate. We have a question here um, from Peter. He, he says, with summarization, my experience is that GPT gives a flat summary without taking into account which information is more important to the audience. How can we solve this problem? What, what comes to mind for, for me is, is, is on, one, on one hand, what Ryan was mentioning earlier, how do we get more metadata into the, the content or the, or into the content or the data that the AI is, is using and using that to, to be more smart about, about the summarization or about the answer. Um, what also applies to me, what occurs to me is, is being more creative with the prompting. Meaning instead of just saying, this is the question, what's the answer? Being to know, okay, this who is logged into the system? What's their profile? Is this pro, is this person have a certain audience? Do they own a certain product specifically? Um, what do we know about them, and what can we use that in order to tell GPT to to give an answer that's maybe more focused on that that would be more useful for that particular person, or might be might, might be more important for that person? Um, I don't know if anyone else has any any answers or or uh, suggestions about that. So, Joe, if I could just jump on that, I actually sure. find that that would be quite helpful in that because I I'm look as I said I'm looking over our, at our analytics right now, and because we have these different products, they may have similar again back to the terminology they may have similar terms, um, because we have different types of customers. We'll have golf customers. We'll have as opposed to uh, customers that are in a, in a restaurant, but they're all asking reservation. So I can't see who's asking the question. I can see the answer. It'd be interesting to know. They may be getting the right answer. It, it, two, there are two things. They may be getting the right answer to the question, but it's not the right answer for them. Right. They may be asking, how do I make a reservation? And they get the answer for how to make a reservation for at a restaurant, you know, or set up reservations at, for the restaurant um, application, but not for, they really were asking about the golf application. So it'd be interesting to be able to see that and also to be able to know that that person who logged in asking that question was someone who was in the CRG associated with, you know, um, the, the our, our application for golf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if the users log in and uh, they have set search preferences, then Zuman does know something about that user. However, if your user is anonymous, which most of ours are, you can't know anything about that user other than just the, the search string or the questions they ask. Back to this, the, the low fuzziness tolerance, what we've just found is that uh, right now we're running of, of every three questions a user asks, uh, two will go unanswered and one will be answered. So it's a, kind of a two to one ratio. And um, we, we already knew about the, the that it's configured not to say, uh, just to, to wing answers if it doesn't know. It just says if it doesn't know, it, it just gives you a non-response. But we are finding that of the answers that GP pre provides, the accuracy is very high. So when GPT does respond, the accuracy is is, is quite good. It's just that it's just kind of a little little uh, frustrating that uh, for, you know every or every three questions you only get a, a good response one out of three times. Mm -hmm. So for us, I just want to add on to that last point real quick. Um, we found it's kind of educating our own internal customers as well as external on the limitations of the tool. So when we first showed this to even other people in the support organizations, 
they thought it was like an all-encompassing tool that indexed everything in the company, internal and external, that they can ask any question. And so we had to make it very clear to them, this is not like an Oracle. It only knows the content we've loaded in there, which happens to be about a thousand or so product guides. It does not have knowledge base articles, community articles, does not have our internal support and sales and marketing documents. And so that that's a big reason, um, not a big reason, but that's one of the reasons why we see people getting no answers on things because it's only a segment of all the content and knowledge in our company. And we would love to expand that, but we're kind of like siloed off in different areas. But it's important for a casual customer to know this won't answer every single question. It will only answer based on the content that's in the system. Well, we've, we've documented the same thing, but really when it comes down to it, users, users don't care about those kind of nuances. Right. Um, but, Neither do uh, VPs at our company. <laughs> We're, we're trying, for example, to, to uh, take our knowledge base and take it from our support site and uh, get that information into, into Zoomin. And that would greatly expand our, our, our universe of, of content. But so that would be a big step for us if we could pull it off. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of uh, security concerns about publicly exposing your knowledge base. So very good. Security questions seem to be more and more taking the forefront. Mm -hmm. Well when um when um we talk about accuracy. So Ryan when you um when you finally get around to writing that topic about the meaningful life, hopefully it'll be it'll be accurate. <laughs> Okay, so maybe we'll, give some, we'll wrap up with some tips for success. Um, I wrote some tips here, I think, again, based on um, some things I've been hearing, um, but I'm happy to hear if you guys can riff off of this. So um, some tips we talked about, ensuring cross-functional um, alignment, including other stakeholders, potential value, can, um, identify constraints like legal and line on legal compliance, um, focusing on, on accuracy, defining a structured way to measure the results, and uh, then iterating and expand. We've been hearing today also about, about how to educating other people, the stakeholders about the further adoption, bring other content into there and just making it overall more and more useful for our customers and partners. So if, um, before we wrap up, if you have anything that you'd like to, um, to add to this, if there's any other questions, then we'll- uh, I think another tip for success is in, in, in not educating just the stakeholders, but educating the um the contributors mm -hmm. for th for them to understand the value of um uh, what what they're putting out there so that they you know can can provide even more success for for the implementation itself very nice yeah, okay. so I just added a quick note. So we, we really want to align more with our support organization who runs our support portals and our knowledge management to get them involved in the process. So they're, they are part of the process, but they're not really driving it. But we find as we partner closer with them, it's mm -hmm. it's mutually beneficial to, to our website and our doc portal. Very good. Okay, I'd like to thank you, uh, all three of you, for joining, joining me for the panel. Uh, I always learn a lot when I talk to you guys, and this is always uh, this I learned a lot today. Also, I was taking some notes while we we're talking, so thank you very much, Don. Thanks very much for hosting us, and the audience, thank you very much for for being there and asking the good questions. Excellent. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, panel. Um, just I'm just looking to see if give everybody a chance if they have any last questions before um, before we let you go. Um, oh, just some interesting and so forth so we really appreciate you taking that time again joe thank you for staying up so late um and uh, we appreciate you guys all um participating